Okay. Um, so today's speaker is um, Steve Flamia from uh, the University of Sydney, and uh, he's going to talk to us about. Uh, I'm going to tell you in just one second. Uh, thermalization, error correction, and memory lifetime for Ising anion systems. Um, so over to you, Steve. So thanks, Matt. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's really nice to be part of this, uh, at least until today, very successful experiment. Um, <laughs> although with this new time slot, uh, maybe becomes a little bit less successful for everyone. <laughs> Um, but, you know, uh, we'll learn from it and we'll see. So as you said, uh, I'm going to talk about error correction for icing anions. Um, this is joint work with Courtney Brell and Simon Burton from the University of Sydney and Guillaume Dauphiné and David Poulin from Sherbrooke. Um, and so uh, I want to reiterate what you said, Matt, about um, questions. If there's anybody in the audience with questions, I'm very happy to stop and answer questions. Uh, the subject of anions, well, probably we already filtered away people who um, have no ambition to learn anything about anions. Uh, but maybe there are a few people who are hoping to learn something about anions, and I hope to actually convey a little bit of information about why they're interesting and important and why we should care about them. Um, so uh, feel free to stop and ask questions. Um, OK. so. To motivate this, uh, I think everyone in this audience knows why we study, uh, or you know, a very typical reason at least for studying um, quantum computation is the idea that quantum, com quantum computers are very likely to outperform classical computers. Um, and in order to do this, uh, we need some form of error correction. Um, so the key problem in uh, quantum error correction is to design good quantum error correcting codes. And uh, there are sort of two facets to this problem. The first is uh, designing codes with good theoretical properties, like um, large minimum distance, for example, or um, positive rate, uh, you know, asymptotically, I mean. Um, whereas um, there are also physical requirements for error correction. And um, when, you, when you look at the physical requirements for the best known error correcting codes, it tends to be very daunting. They tend to have very high weight stabilizers. Um, certainly, uh, we're not going to be implementing these error correcting codes anytime soon. Uh, so the key idea of a topological quantum error correcting code is the following. Um, if nature encodes, uh, if nature acts locally, then we should encode our information globally. So this idea goes back to Kataev's paper from uh, the mid 90s, although it wasn't, he didn't bother publishing it until 2003. Um, and the idea is that if we have certain non local degrees of freedom, and we can do our information processing, our thinking, in those global degrees of freedom, uh, then they should somehow have some robustness to the errors which nature creates locally. So, what are these topological quantum codes? Um, well, I already told you the main idea, store information robustly in global degrees of freedom. The example that uh, we'll use uh, at first is the Toric code. Um, so Katai have also had a few other insights for um, why these topological degrees of freedom would be interesting. And it turns out uh, something you can do with uh, something called non-abelian anions, which I'll get to in a minute, um, but you can't do in the Toric code is you can actually do information processing. You can do topological quantum computation. So um, here, instead of just a quantum memory, we're interested in actually doing computation. Uh, we have quantum gates, which correspond to topological invariants in a particular way, so that um, if a gate, uh, so they, they correspond to braiding of the world lines of particles that live in certain two-dimensional media uh, around each other, and if you slightly deform these braids, um, then um, the, the quantum gate is naturally robust. It doesn't depend on the specific details of the path. It just depends on the topology. Um, so then these gates inherit some natural robustness in this way. So icing anions are one particular class that has this extra power that you don't see in the Torah code, this quantum computation power, topological quantum computation power. 
Um, they're not universal, but, and I'll say more about that later. Uh, but you can do non-trivial gates. Um, however, the key point in this talk is that icing anions, and in fact any of the schemes for topological quantum computation or quantum memory using non-abelian anions, they all still need error correction. There's always going to be a phase uh, during the course of your computation where you measure and you try to read out and uh, it will be ambiguous, potentially, uh, what what the actual state, what the logical state should be. Uh, so the goal of this project is to demonstrate that in fact it's possible to do error correction uh, with non-abelian anions, but in particular with icing anions. So, okay, as I said, the paradigmatic example of anions, these are going to be abelian anions, is the Torah code. So let's view the Torah code. Um, we have a square lattice, Okay, so we have n qubits, and the qubits are located on the edges of a square lattice, and we put periodic boundary conditions. And then uh, for every uh, little feature, either vertex or plaquette, on this square lattice, we associate a stabilizer just with the neighbors of that vertex or plaquette. So as you can see in the drawing, uh, for every vertex V, we associate the product of sigma x around that vertex. And for every plaquette, we associate the product of sigma z around that plaquette. Uh, you can define logical operators, and they have a natural topological interpretation as non-contractible loops around the torus. So these are products of sigma z's and sigma x's that wrap around non-contractible loops around the torus an odd number of times. You can interpret the stabilizer operators as giving rise to localized particles. Uh, and then you can ask yourself, so I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute. You can ask yourself, are these particles bosons or fermions? When, when, when I say interpret the stabilizer operators as giving rise to localized particles, um, what I mean is if the stabilizers are plus one, there's no particle there. And if it's minus one, uh, then we say that there's a particle there. And I'll be a little more explicit about it on the next slide. Um, so, oh, that got a little crowded. These are... Um, these, these are neither, these particles are neither bosons nor fermions. They're examples of anions, as I'll show in a moment. Okay, so um, the charges live at sites. Okay, so what's a site? A site is just a merge between a vertex and a plaquette. So it's a neighboring, I pick, let's say, the northeast corner of my lattice, or, you know, I pick some consistent, some consistent set of vertex plaquette pairs, um, and they're in one-to-one -one correspondence, so I can do that. And I call that merged thing a site. So it contains the possibility of both an X-type stabilizer and a Z-type stabilizer, or both. Um, so uh, at the, you know, I, I'm defining these things to be point-like. And if you kind of zoom out, these things look very point-like. And these are, in some sense, a locally conserved quantity, which I'll explain in a minute, which is that. Uh, the, the, so let's imagine we're in a stabilizer eigenstate, okay? And I can look locally at each of these sites, and each of these quantum numbers is now well-defined, right? So um, I can ask what, be, because the Torah code is a stabilizer code and all of these stabilizers commute, right? So I can ask, if I'm in a, an eigenstate, uh, what value do these local stabilizer operators have? So uh, one possibility is that they're both plus one. So I'm going to call this a vacuum particle. Another possibility is that just the vertex term is flipped, the sign of that one is flipped. I'm going to call that an electric particle. The naming convention here has to do uh, with the fact that this is a representation of a particular gauge theory and um, doesn't actually interest us for this talk, but this is the terminology. So if the vertex operator is, has its sign flipped, then we call that an electric particle. Similarly, if the plaquette operator has its sign flipped, then we call it a magnetic particle. And if both of them have their sign flipped, then we call it a dionic particle. And it's some kind of weird hybrid between an electric, a particle with a unit of electric charge and a particle with a unit of magnetic charge, right? Which, you know, we don't have isolated magnetic charges um, 
in standard electromagnetism, but we do in this weird theory. Okay, so um, there are certain uh, features of this Torah code uh, which we want to um, understand in such a way that we can abstract naturally to more general anion models. Uh, and one of them is fusion. So what's fusion? Well, we all know what you know particle pair creation is, right? Particles can be created out of the vacuum as long as uh, the sum of their quantum numbers obeys, uh, or, or you know, as well as numbers like momentum. So they have to obey all the relevant conservation laws that we know about. So fusion is the reverse process of this. Two particles can't annihilate into a third particle unless um, the sum of them, in some sense, unless the total of all of their quantum numbers obeys all the relevant conservation laws. Okay, And I'll get more specific about that in a moment. So we have this operation fusion, where we merge particles into new particles. Um, so by uh, so let's do an example of this. So in the stabilizer formalism, uh, here I have two flipped stabilizers. Okay, and as you've probably, as probably many of you have seen, um, I can imagine that these uh, flipped stabilizers are connected continuously by a string of bit flips at the physical level. So I have a string of physical bit flips connecting these two uh, flipped stabilizers, and if I were to merge them together then they would fuse back to vacuum. Okay, so I can write this, um, you, can, you can think of this heuristically, but actually it's, um, uh, it's very precise. I have E times E equals uh, vacuum. Okay, so the times on the left-hand side means fusion, and the things on the right-hand side are the products of that fusion. And in this case, uh, there's a unique fusion product. So um, a product of two, charges of electric type fuses uniquely to vacuum. We can ask the same question about the magnetic type particles, the plaquette, flipped plaquettes. If we do the same thing, then we find um, we find that M fused with M gives us vacuum. And then uh, we can compile, you know, we can, we can figure out what all of these rules are, and we find that uh, unsurprisingly, vacuum fusing with vacuum gives vacuum, okay? Uh, vacuum fusing with any of the other particles and the, and the other particle uh, remains itself, right? That's these rules over here on the left. Um, we have that E fused with M gives us a dion, right? This is sort of unsurprising and so on for various cyclic permutations. Oops. Uh, yeah, and then uh, we find that uh, a dion is its own antiparticle. Okay, so um, we can ask about other exotic phenomena that we uh, know about from other contexts. We can ask, are these things bosons and fermions? What properties do bosons and fermions have? Well, they have exchange statistics, right? So if I have two identical particles and I exchange them, then they can pick up an exchange phase, okay? So uh, here I've just animated um, an electric charge and a magnetic charge exchanging, okay? But you know we know if you do the computation, you can just compute that the exchange phases, uh, which I'll label R, for two electric types or two magnetic types, those exchange phases are one. So these things behave like bosons. Two dionic combinations, on the other hand, if you do the math, they turn out to have an exchange phase of minus one. So this dionic thing is a fermion. Well, this is kind of strange, right? Because it doesn't very well seem consistent that if I merge an E and an M, uh, which are both bosons, that I can get a fermion, right? Well, it seems a bit strange, right? Um, but we can ask, there's additional stuff we can do here. We can ask about mutual statistics. So in the case that I've animated, we have one M and one E, and I can ask, what happens if I exchange them? What sign do I get? Um, and you can, you can also compute uh, what are called monodromies, where I do a double exchange to get them back to where they started. right? And if you do that, then you compute that the product of these exchange phases is minus one. Okay, So these are two distinguishable particle types. 
And if I exchange places twice to bring them back to their original configuration, then uh, the overall exchange phase that I pick up is minus one. So this is a little bit bizarre, right? There's no, um, so th these are somewhat exotic objects. Um, okay, so uh, there are a few other features uh, that are present that tend to generalize but are less important for this talk. Um, one very important feature of the Torah code is that it's the degenerate ground space of a local Hamiltonian. Um, and so this means that we, you know, we can try to find ways to implement it um, in physical systems. Um, I mentioned that the logical operators correspond to non-trivial loops, but I haven't really gone into any details about that um, because it might cause some confusion uh, with one of the error correcting codes that I introduced later. Um, so I'm not going to go into any more details about the Torah code. Instead, I'm just going to um, I'm going to take some of these features that we saw in the context of the Torah code, and I'm going to use them to motivate uh, the study of more general Anion models. So I'm certainly not going to give a um, rigorous introduction to these. I'm just going to go over the relevant features um, for the error correction, which I'm going to describe later. Uh, so this will be a little bit... Uh, uh, I'm going to gloss over some details, but um, again, if you guys have any questions, please just stop and ask. So um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to keep this two-dimensional property because that was crucial for those uh, funny exchange statistics, uh, exchange phases that we saw. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to the first thing that we're going to abstract away is we're going to say um, in the Torah code we had a list of particle types, so we're just going to say. Uh, and any on theory begins with a list of particle types, and they can be any finite list of labels you, that you want to give to your particles. Um, however, one of them needs to be vacuum. Oh, can you guys see my mouse? Oh, yes? Okay, because I can't see my mouse, but um, that's all right. Uh, at least now I know I can point to stuff. Okay, sorry. So at least one of the particle labels needs to be uh, vacuum, okay? This is sort of like uh, requiring that the identity be part of a group. If we didn't have this, uh, the theory would be uh, really strange and weird, and you know, physically we kind of expect something to behave like vacuum. And in the context of icing anions, we have two additional particles. We have uh, psi and sigma, which I'll describe their properties in a bit. And in analogy with what I described for the Torah code, we have two processes of interest. We have this fusion, which is, or pair creation, right? These are time reversals of each other. And we have braiding. So first of all, what's fusion? Fusion is an operation. It's commutative, it's associative, and it's distributive. That'll be clear in a minute. Um, and it's, you can think of it as the total charge of a collection of anions, okay? And, and I'll go through it in the context of a pair of anions. And because of these other properties, commutative, associative, distributive, that'll, that'll determine all possible fusion products. So we just write it like this. This is an analogy with what we wrote with the Torah code, except in the case of the Torah code, every fusion product was uniquely determined by the uh, input to the fusion process, right? So if we had two dionic particles, then they... Uh, uniquely fused to vacuum. But in a general anion theory, the fusion products are not uniquely determined. Okay? And so um, that's going to give rise to... Uh, uh, the, so whenever this happens, uh, we say when the degeneracy of the fusion products is greater than one for at least some pair of elementary charges in the anion theory, we call that anion theory a non-abelian anion theory. Um, so we're going to use little diagrams, like the one on the right, to describe um, some of the processes that I'm talking about. And this is the simplest diagram. This would be, um, depending on which way you read it, is either a fusion or a splitting. So you can think of this as saying particles A and B fuse to give particle C. Um, and you can take linear combinations of these diagrams as well. 
with complex amplitudes. Um, as I mentioned, importantly, there's always a vacuum, which has the property that for any charge B, uh, fusing the vacuum with B always gives back B uniquely. So in the case of icing anions, there are just three non-trivial fusion rules. This particle psi is its own antiparticle. The particle sigma and can emit or absorb a psi particle and it doesn't change, right? Its charge type doesn't change. Okay, so I can fuse psi and sigma and I just always get back a sigma. However, and this is where it gets interesting, if I have two sigma particles, it can fuse in one of two different ways, okay? So a fusion of two sigma particles either gives the identity or a psi particle, okay? Um, so this is where we get this uh, non-abelian, uh, this terminology non-abelian anion, so now this is why icing anions are non-abelian, because they have uh, a non-union fusion product. Um, and there's going to be, we're going to eventually associate a non-local Hilbert space to these fusion products. Um, and here's just sort of diagrammatically what we imagine doing uh, when we consider fusion products. We can uh, sort of think of it as being the total charge in some region, this circled region here, um, uh, because we can always just merge the charges that are inside that region uh, and fuse them to some single charge. Of course, if it's a non-abelian theory, that may not have, um, depending on the, the state of all of those particles, the joint state, it may not have a, um, a charge eigenstate as uh, the fusion product, but um, if we were to measure, we would certainly find one of those if we measure the total charge. Okay, so um, the fusion outcomes that we get from that process that I just showed, uh, they depend on the history, the braids and the world lines of these particles. So by braiding anions around each other, I can change these fusion outcomes. Okay, these are how we do gates in topological quantum computation. So um, we get these exchange phases, which in general uh, are going to be, um, they're going to turn out to be matrices, but for uh, everything in this talk, it's always still just a complex number. So if I uh, braid um, particles A and B, and there's a, there's a convention choice here, by the way, which is that I braid them uh, clockwise when looking from above. That's sort of a minor detail. Um, if I braid them around each other in the canonical sense, then I can replace a diagram the diagram on the left by the diagram on the right times this exchange phase. Okay, so this is exactly an analogy with what we do uh, in the Torah code. All right, so here's some depiction of two sigma particles exchanging uh, in the correct uh, orientation. Um, now, in general, of course, in non-abelian theories, A and B don't have unique fusion products, so we need to keep an additional label around which tells us uh, the sort of conditional state on if they were fusing to C, what's the exchange phase, right? And C can loop over all the possible fusion products of A and B. Okay, so in general, we'll have lots of these exchange phases, R, A, B, and they're labeled by C, which are the possible fusion products of A and B. So for icing anions, uh, the ones, so we have a bunch of these things, and the ones on the left, we have that if I exchange uh, two particles of type psi, well, first of all, there's only one way that two psi particles can fuse. They can only fuse to the vacuum. And if I exchange them, I get a minus one. So psi particles behave, at least with respect to each other, like fermions. Similarly, if I exchange a psi and a sigma, such that the fusion product of these two is a sigma, or, uh, you know, if I do the opposite process, so depending on which sense I rotate them, I get a minus i. Now it turns out that these phases are all uninteresting because they all map into global phases. But over here on the right is the interesting bit. So sigma particles have non-unique fusion products, and uh, depending on what their fusion product is, I get two different exchange phases 
And this is going to give rise to a relative phase, uh, which we can induce just by braiding sigma particles around each other. All the phases on the left are all global phases and are somehow uninteresting. Uh, but the ones on the right are going to give us some notion of computation. So there's a bunch more details associated with anions that I'm skipping over. Um, there are things called F symbols, which tell you how to um, consistently do uh, the associative rule. Uh, there's something called a modular S matrix, which I'll very briefly mention later. There are certain consistency relations, which tell you um, how to map these fusion spaces into one another consistently. Um, and a good introduction to this is Appendix E of Kataev's paper called Anions in an Exactly Solved Model and Beyond from 2006. Um, uh, it's, it's an appendix, but it's, uh, it's really well written and detailed. Um, so if you want to learn more about this stuff, uh, uh, that's a great place to look. But we don't need any of these extra details for this talk. I'm just mentioning them here for completeness. Okay, so now we've seen um, we've seen general anion theories, and um, I tried to motivate the specific details, uh, or I tried to you know to be concrete. I was mentioning the icing anions, um, but why do we care about icing anions to begin with, right? I mean, I tried to motivate them from the perspective of non-abelian anions, but in fact, out of the set of all non-abelian anion models, uh, they're actually pretty special. Um, for one thing, uh, we expect them to be experimentally accessible, um, you know, on timescales of our lifetime. Uh, <laughs> so, um, for example, um, there's very strong theoretical evidence that these things exist uh, as excitations in certain fractional quantum Hall systems at filling factor nu equals 5 halves. Um, Kitai, the paper that I cited on the previous slide, Kataev's honeycomb model, is a very simple model. There are proposals to implement this model in optical lattices, for example. So uh, there are reasonable prospects that we will see icing anions uh, in the somewhat near future. There are also exactly solvable models, which we can use to study these things. For example, string net models, also Kataev's honeycomb model. So we have good theoretical handles on these things. They're, uh, and they're one of the simplest non-abelian anion models as well. So um, the theoretical models are somewhat tractable as well. There are a couple other nice features. The first one is that the anion dynamics is uh, classically simulable. So much like we can simulate Clifford circuits, we can simulate anion dynamics if they're icing anions, which is not true in general. And um, there's a nice paper by uh, Sergey Bravi, which shows that if you have magic state distillation, um, then you can use icing anions plus magic state distillation to do universal quantum computation. So um, we, can, we can activate these icing anions into an even more interesting resource uh, if we're clever. Okay, so um, how are we going to uh, do gates in this icing anion model? I mentioned that we do it with braiding, but let's be a little bit more specific about what our Hilbert space is that we're working in when we have a collection of icing anions. So the simplest possible thing we can have is four icing anions. Now down here at the bottom, I fixed a label of vacuum, okay? So what is this? If I imagine going up here and just encircling all of these guys by one big measurement apparatus, and I ask, what's the total charge for all of these four sigma particles, then they should fuse to some definite outcome. This is equivalent to basically requiring that I can initialize my computer from a simple state. I'm going to just say that these guys all fuse to vacuum. Okay, Just think of that as an initialization condition or uh, the simplest possible boundary condition that you should, you should put on this system. Okay, But aside from that, um, we're going to have some more uh, non-determinism, or, well, sorry, non-uniqueness in the fusion products. So these two sigma particles on the left, I'm going I'm to imagine fusing these things sequentially. Okay, so let's fuse this pair of particles on the left. So we know from what we said before that a pair of sigma particles fuse uh, non-uniquely. It can either fuse to vacuum or it can fuse to psi. Okay, so these two fusion channels we're going to use as our digital 
uh, logic. These are going to be our qubit. They're, they will comprise our qubit. However, regardless of their fusion product, a product of a site or a vacuum with a sigma particle always yields a sigma pro particle. Okay, and then because of the global constraint, these two sigma particles are not free to also fuse to a psi. I've forced them to fuse to vacuum. Okay, so the point of this is that I can associate a non-local Hilbert space. Right, by non-local I just mean that it's shared jointly among these four anions. Uh, and it has two basis states, which are labeled by these trees, and I can put complex amplitudes in front of them. Nobody ever draws kets around these things in practice, but I think it's an illustrative thing to do. So these are our 0 and our 1, are these diagrams. Okay, um, so the way that we would get gates Sorry, in this Steve, model there's, is a, there's a question in the chat question. room that you might want to uh, look at. Uh, Aaron okay. asks, uh, how do you do the forcing? How do I do the what? How, how do you force the constraint of... Uh, going to the vacuum at the bottom. Oh, of the okay. Um, well, mathematically, I just... Uh, in, uh, <laughs> mathematically, it's trivial. Physically, it's... Uh, I, I don't know how one would do it in practice, because I don't know anything about physical realizations of these things, but um, the physical motivation is uh, sort of... We don't want to assume that we have... Uh, so the alternative would be to put a boundary condition that says we could put sort of no boundary condition, then there would be, um, they would be free to take whatever product they want, and then we would only need two sigma particles to get a qubit. Um, but somehow the uh, requiring that they fuse to vacuum is a natural condition because we expect that um, it costs some energy to create these states. And um, if we were actually building this in some lab, we would be cooling this thing down to some ground state. Um, so it would be natural that... Um, uh, we wouldn't see too many excitations, uh, so we would have to create these things from vacuum ourselves. So uh, maybe that gives some motivation for why we choose the boundary conditions to be what they are. I hope that answers the question. Okay, so um, the next thing we can do to do gates, we can braid collections of these anions around each other. Um, and if you do the math, uh, you uh, can figure out what the action of this braiding is on our Hilbert space that we just defined, which is spanned by those states that I mentioned. And um, if you do that, uh, you get um, you get the following matrix over here. So this acts on the Hilbert space spanned by the zero and the one that we have. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so another reason uh, for Aaron is that global charge is conserved. Of course, uh, you may not have an isolated system, uh, so, uh, but that's sort of, you could think of that as some initialization error or something, but, you know, globally, uh, charge is conserved, so charge can't come from nothing. So that's why, so if these things are in an isolated system, then they should globally fuse to, fuse to vacuum. Okay. Um, so uh, we can extend the action of these gates. So, you know, I've just uh, redrawn that same... This is a much more complicated version of the 2x2 uh, two two matrix on the previous slide. <laughs> um, and then the action of that matrix on this state uh, is up to a global phase. It just flips the sign between these two basis states. Okay, so this is um, like a sigma z. Um, okay, so that's how we would do gates. Um, we can, uh, so I mentioned that we can simulate the dynamics of the uh, icing anions. So to do that, um, one natural thing you can do is you can associate uh, to every sigma particle. Uh, so actually, let me back up. So because the fusion products of collections of psi particles are, this is, this is the last bullet point down here. Um, psi particles only introduce global phases, so we can essentially ignore them. It's, it's, there's nothing to keep track of if we're simulating, right? We're not interested in global phases. On the other hand, um, these sigma particles, large collections of these sigma particles, 
um, they will have a, if I have n of them, there's a 2 to the n minus 1 because of the global charge constraint. There's a Hilbert space of that dimension, and so if I want to simulate these things, uh, I need a better way to keep track of them than brute force. So um, there's something which is essentially stabilizers. I mean, it is just stabilizers. Um, uh, to each sigma particle, I can uh, associate a mode operator, C. Okay, this is a Majorana mode. If you don't know what a Majorana fermion is, it doesn't actually matter. Um, the point is that um, the eigenvalues of products of these guys give you, according to this formula, if I have two uh, sigma particles, sigma 1 and sigma 2, with Majorana mode operators C1 and C2, then this operator M, its eigenvalues correspond to the fusion outcomes that I would get, the vacuum and the psi. Um, so um, the action of braiding these sigma particles around each other, you can map to an action on these Majorana modes. Um, and what you get is that uh, a clockwise braid of two sigma particles that are neighbors just uh, takes C1 and maps it to C2, and takes C2 and maps it to minus C1. So this is a signed permutation. Okay, so I just list, I have a collection of labels for these sigma particles, which I've called C, and if I braid them, then all I have to do is permute my labels up to some signs. Okay, so um, these are, uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that you see when you're simulating uh, Clifford circuits, right? So this is the sense in which icing anions can be simulated. In fact, we could be very explicit about mapping it to stabilizers using a jordan wigner type transformation. Um, but you can see that because we're never mapping, um, we're never mapping these operators into linear combinations of each other, it's a simple closed algebra and it always stays in this uh, sort of Majorana basis, if you will, um, uh, for all time steps, no matter what sort of braidings happen. Okay, so that's what enables us to simulate icing dynamics. Um, there's a bit of a subtle point when I say, well, on the previous slide I said, uh, you know, two neighboring particles. I can exchange two neighboring particles. So what do I mean by neighboring? Well, it's a little bit subtle. There's sort of two notions of neighbor. Um, two anions on some lattice. Here I've discretized space, uh, which I'll do more explicitly on the next slide. Um, these two guys, which share a red edge, are neighbors in physical space, and I can braid them around each other clockwise. Um, but I have to pick a specific generating set to describe my braids. Okay? This is equivalent to fixing the braid group up to some automorphism. So what I have to do is I have to pick a linear sequence. I have to label uh, all of these anions in some order, 1 through n. And then um, all of my braid generators are chosen with respect to that linear ordering. Right? Anytime you've ever seen pictures of the braid group, right, you always order everything on a line. Okay? But in two dimensions, um, there's, there are lots of choices of um, how you order things. Um, so what we do is uh, we, we pick some particular choice. This is the one that we choose for our simulations. And then um, this bottom figure shows how we map neighbors in physical space to neighbors with respect to our linear ordering. Okay? And so um, even if things are neighbors in physical space, the braid moves that they do might be kind of non-trivial. They might have to braid past large numbers of anions. This red one in particular sort of weaves in between uh, several different anions just to do one exchange phase. So it can be a little bit non-trivial to implement this. Um, if you don't follow that, it's uh, in some sense a detail, but it is a very important detail when you're actually implementing this stuff. So that's why I include this slide. So as I said, um, you know, we're, we're doing, at the end of the day, we're actually going to compute an error correction threshold. So we better uh, discretize space uh, if we want to fit it on a computer. And um, we have a lattice, and at each point on the lattice, we're going to associate a three-dimensional space, which has um, vacuum, psi, or sigma charge. And then we're going to allow uh, various operations, which um, are natural microscopic operations to expect are possible for um, 
for these particles. So we can create two particles out of the vacuum. Uh, that's pair creation. Uh, we can hop them. We can, of course, exchange them as well, as I showed on a previous slide. And then, of course, if two particles um, are adjacent to each other, maybe we measure, um, or you know, maybe one hops on top of another, and then we could maybe fuse. Um, we could take, we could look at their fusion product. We could decohere, right? So locally, we can deco decohere. Uh, so we associate rates to all of those processes, and then we do some sort of Monte Carlo sampling. So, um, so how do we do that? So the way that we do our Monte Carlo sampling is we choose some number of time steps t. Uh, I don't, I, I neglected it on the slide here, but we choose it to be a, a Poisson random variable um, uh, with some mean t naught. Um, so we choose t time steps from a Poisson distribution. And then for each of those time steps, we sample an edge uniformly across the whole lattice. And we know we're keeping track of the charge configuration at every time step. And then uh, conditioned on a particular charge configuration between edge i and edge j, we imagine that the edges are oriented for the purposes of the Monte Carlo sampling. Um, we have some set of allowed processes. And not all processes are allowed because some of them would just be trivial and it doesn't make sense to waste uh, Monte Carlo samplings, uh, sampling processes which don't do anything interesting. Um, so we sample from these allowed processes. These are the allowed processes um, according to the relative rates. So on the previous slide, I, I said we had some rates gamma for each of these things, and we look at relative uh, rates between these processes. And then we, we sum them up to get a total error rate, and then um, you know, that, that's what we'll be plotting against, is that total error rate uh, in, in a few slides. So um, we expect that this uh, Monte Carlo, that this phenomenological model captures um, short time scale physics uh, when these, when the system is far from equilibrium. So when the, it's in contact with the thermal reservoir, which is at a high enough temperature that um, it's able to that the that the bath is able to create these charges and hop them around and move them, etc. You could also vary these relative rates to try to capture um, a particularly relevant regime. For example, um, if you have a very if you have a cooler bath, maybe um, hopping is a more dominant process, but pair creation is suppressed by Boltzmann factors. For example. Okay. So now, um, let's define, so if we're going to study error correction, we better have error correcting codes. So we have two error correcting codes. The first one is in this fusion space where we explicitly defined uh, the action of the gates. So here what we do is we choose spherical boundary conditions and we pin four sigma particles at uh, opposite points on the sphere. So think of a tetrahedron, right, inscribed in a sphere. And we put, the initial configuration is we put four sigma particles at the points of those tetrahedron, and then we discretize the surface of that sphere. And um, topologically, at least, uh, that's what's drawn over here on the right. So uh, because of global uh, charge conservation, um, uh, these anions globally fuse to vacuum. There's a second code that we can define, uh, which we're not going to go into details here about this one because uh, this one is still work in progress. We are not done the numerics with this one yet. This one is a little bit more natural in analogy with the Torah code. Here, we don't have spherical boundary conditions and we're not working in the fusion space, but much like the Torah code, we're working in the degenerate uh, we're working in a degenerate space, which arises from um, the topological considerations. And um, the logical operators are much like the Torah code, associated with non-trivial, non-contractible loops around the torus. Um, so this one's more natural in analogy with the Torah code. But it's more subtle than this, uh, what we were calling the fusion code on the previous slide. Um, for one thing, you have to keep track of extra generators of your braid group, which are associated with braid moves that loop non-trivially around the torus. So this is something called the Fox braid group. So you have to be careful there. Um, 
you, uh, you, it, it's possible for you to have singleton charge configurations. What do I mean by that? So if I start out globally in the vacuum state and then I create two sigma particles and they wrap non-trivially around the torus, um, well, it actually depends on um, what the logical state of the um, code is, but uh, you can have it so that those sigma particles fuse back to a psi particle. So now you just have a single isolated psi, which would seem to violate charge conservation. Um, I mean, it's all consistent, in fact, but you have to uh, you have to be very careful about uh, how you keep track of the state of the logical qubit in the code. Um, and yeah, these these singleton operators uh, are kind of a headache. Also, unlike in the Tor code. Um, there's this modular symmetry, which I very briefly alluded to, and it in fact couples the two different loops around the torus. Uh, so they're not independent. So if something happens on one loop of the torus, you have to maybe map it back to the other loop of the torus, see what its action is over there, and then map it forward again. Um, it's, uh, it's challenging. But we're not going to go into those details. I'm just sort of... Uh, uh, think of this as an announcement that this um, this we, we figured out how this code works. Okay, so um, so if you're doing oh this one it's a little this slide is a little messed up, but I guess you can read it anyway. Um, we we looked at to do error correction. You need the uh, the last ingredient to do error correction is a decoder, um, and we have two decoders. Uh, the first one that we looked at, although I won't present the numerical results uh, because um, they're not as compelling and the thresholds are lower. Uh, the first decoder that we looked at is this decoder by Bravi. Uh, so this idea of an RG decoder has been explored by a few authors. Uh, the version that we've looked at is this version by Bravi and Ha. And here the idea is to try to cluster the, um, here I use the language defects because that's what they say in their paper, but I, I take the particles and I if they're very close together, then I try to cluster them and then I double my length scale, at which I mean close together, and then I try to cluster next nearest neighbors and so on. And I do this, uh, I iterate over this process until I reach the global scale of the lattice. Um, so you can adapt this decoder to the non-abelian setting. There are two important differences from the two Tor code case. Um, you have to measure the charge configuration after every iteration. Um, this makes it seem like it would be difficult to use other versions um, of the RG decoder. I'll say a little bit more about this uh, later. So we have to measure the charge configuration after each iteration. And um, one thing that we found we think gives slightly better thresholds is that we first run the decoder on just the sigma particles. Now remember that the sigma particles always either fuse to vacuum or to psi. So if we run it on just the collection of psi particles, we're, uh, sorry, sigma particles, we're left with just a collection of psi particles. Okay, then we run the decoder again on the residual psi particles. And we found that this worked slightly better than just trying to like squish everything together um, and not differentiate. Um, but a decoder which works a little bit better, it gives cleaner thresholds and higher values of the threshold is the one based on Edmund's perfect matching algorithm, which was uh, first discussed in this classic paper by Dennis et al. Um, so this has been used a lot uh, with respect to the Torah code case, but again, there are a few important differences. Um, we again do this iteration over charge type. Um, uh, so, and we uh, again measure charge configurations. So, we, um, so here's the perfect matching algorithm illustrated, we first find uh, a minimum weight in terms of path length matching between just the sigma particles. We fuse them together. Some of them fuse to psi particles, some of them fuse to vacuum. We can, of course, ignore all the vacuum particles. Then we run, we try to find another minimum weight perfect matching um, on the remaining psi particles, and these guys fuse to vacuum. We just have to hope uh, it's a decoding failure if I accidentally wrap something non-trivially around the torus. Um, okay, so those are our decoders. Um, there's one additional subtlety uh, when we're studying uh, decoding, which is that um, 
we need to determine whether or not a logical error occurred. Now, in the Torah code case, and indeed any code that I've seen a threshold for has always been a CSS code. Um, in a CSS code, you can treat the X and the Z operators independently. But in our case, we can't do that. So the action of the error channel on our code space um, doesn't respect this sort of XZ symmetry. Um, so in order to check whether or not a logical error has occurred, we, um, we use the following theorem, which uh, can be found in these papers down here, that a code space is perfectly preserved by the action of a channel if and only if the channel preserves the generators of the matrix algebra for the code space. Um, so uh, this little picture here shows that if a channel preserves uh, sigma x and it preserves sigma y, then because it's a completely positive map, there's a very strong constraint. It must also perfectly, it must also be the identity on sigma z. Therefore, it's globally the identity channel. Okay, so CP is a very strong constraint here. And, we can use that to uh, help us test more efficiently um, whether or not a logical error has happened in these codes. Okay, so now, all right, that was kind of a lot. So let's put all these ingredients together. What do we have? We've defined an error correcting code. We've defined a couple error correcting codes, but in particular, we're gonna focus on the fusion code with the four pin sigma particles. We've developed a phenomenological noise model where we uh, specify various rates for pair creation and hopping and we're gonna add some noise. Then we're gonna simulate the dynamics using this nice mapping to the stabilizer formalism. And we're gonna measure syndromes, which are just the presence or absence of particles on each of the sites on the lattices. Okay, those are our syndromes. Then we apply one of our decoders. In this case, uh, we're gonna apply the perfect matching decoder. And then we can use uh, this test uh, using this um, uh, preserved algebra theorem uh, we can use that to test whether or not a logical error has occurred. Then we do a bunch of Monte Carlo sampling for various error rates, and we try to see if there's a threshold uh, for this encoding as a function of the noise strength. Um, ah, there's one additional subtlety, uh, which is that because we're working in this picture where our noise is, uh, the noise is Poisson, it's not necessarily, it's not in general directly comparable to the standard case of errors that people study in terms of IID errors. However, in the special case um, of just, if we, if we zero out the sigma particle creation rate and we only consider psi particles, this is exactly like considering just one type of uh, error, either X or Z in the Torah code. And in that case, there's an exact mapping between this um, Poisson thermal error model and the IID error model. And um, these are the equations which tell you how to do that mapping um, from the IID error model that people have uh, more typically considered to the, um, this Poisson case. Okay, so then we have some numerics. So this is our benchmark using this psi only uh, error model that I just described where we have an exact mapping and we can exactly compare it to the Torah code case. Um, and we find, roughly speaking, uh, this is, you know, we don't have super large sizes. We've gone up to 32. And so the threshold, this is some quasi-threshold, and it's still sliding back a bit. But roughly speaking, it's about 11.6%. And this compares, so to compare that with the Torah code, which I think the analogous threshold in the Torah code should be about 10.9%. So there's a bit of a discrepancy. Uh, we think that this is due to two facts, one being just finite size effects. And uh, the second one being that the, the code here is a little bit different than in the Taurus case, presumably, uh, and that's because our code space, like our, our, our decoders, the non-trivial uh, logical operations for our um, pinned anion code, if a sigma particle sort of tunnels from one pinned point on the sphere to another pinned point on the sphere, that would be a logical error. And um, topologically, this isn't quite the same as um, things wrapping around a torus. Uh, so we think that there are certain 
finite size effects there that would account for this discrepancy. Um, we're not entirely sure about that at the moment, though. But Sorry, Steve, speaking, that, Steve, there was a question about uh, what L is on the graph, the label hmm. L. Thank you. Yeah, I should have said that. It's an L by L uh, lattice that's been folded into a sphere um, using a picture that I showed on a previous slide. So, um, yeah, th there are L squared total physical sites. Okay, so it's L by L. Thank you. So, okay, so this is broadly speaking comparable to what we expect. Okay, I mean, it gives us confidence that our code is working, although we don't understand all the features. <clears throat> so now uh, we can make this non abelian now. We can turn up the creation rate on the sigma particles. So this graph is um, for uh, both. So I've turned off hopping, I've turned off braiding and decoherence. All of those processes are now suppressed. But sigmas and psi's are created in pairs at equal rates. Um, and here, and again, don't read too much into this particular number because it's not directly comparable to an IID noise model, uh, but our threshold with respect to this uh, noise strength parameter that we have, that we've defined, um, we have a threshold at 24% using this perfect matching decoder for this uh, fusion code on a sphere. Um, and you know, that'll probably shift down a little bit further um, as we eliminate the uh, finite size effects. Um, but uh, if, we, if we now turn on the additional processes, hopping, braiding, these other things which are non-trivial only in the context, uh, sorry, well at least the braiding is only non-trivial in the context of um, non-abelian anion models, uh, we find some other graphs that we've done. Uh, and these are preliminary, but uh, broadly speaking, um, you know, the overall features don't change. We, we see a threshold or some quasi-threshold um, around 24%. Um, here's one where we add decoherence into the mix. Um, so the overall story is unchanged. So the point is uh, we actually find uh, a threshold for these codes. So in conclusion, um, so we can decode. So what are, what are some open questions here? Um, you might want to try to decode general Enion models. Um, this sounds great. Uh, certainly, we can do error correction on these things, but how would we ever compute a threshold? We would have to track the dynamics of large numbers of non-abelian enions whose dynamics is universal for quantum computation. Well, that's a BQP hard problem, right? So this seems unlikely to be possible. Um, some other ideas for open questions and uh, is fault-tolerant decoding. Is this possible in the non-abelian setting? Um, so uh, Sherbrooke, the Sherbrooke team has some ideas for how to do this. This is ongoing work at Sherbrooke. Um, I mentioned that with these decoders we have to measure the total charge when we do these iterations. Um, could it be possible to use some of the uh, belief propagation uh, soft thresholding decoders, uh, RG decoders, like the ones that David and um, his student, uh, a different Guillaume, have developed. Can we use those in the context of non-abelian enions? That's an open question. Um, obviously, we would like to get better and more accurate thresholds and understand the finite size effects. And also, uh, it would be nice to move away from the microscopic, uh, sorry, from the phenomenological model and move to a specific microscopic model, for example, the honeycomb model. Uh, this is something that we're currently looking at in Sydney. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Um, hang on a second. I'm going to switch to your video for, for now. Um, so yeah, if people have questions, um, then uh, please indicate in the, in the chat room if you're in the Hangout itself. And also, you know, we, we do have quite a few people watching on the live stream. If you have questions, please um, write them in the in the comments feed underneath uh, the video there. Um, I'm going to start with a stupid question of my own, which is okay. uh, <laughs> why are they called? Why exactly are they called Ising anions? Huh. Um, you know, I really should know that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like um, I, I, is that Rob Pfeiffer in the background? He knows. <laughs> I just Actually, Rob Pfeiffer. No, I don't know. I don't know either. No. Okay. Maybe maybe Courtney Brell is logged in and he knows. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I feel like I did at some point and I'm blanking on it though. Okay. Um, well, I if somebody knows the answer, please chime in. Okay. It seems that they had to be related to the rising model yeah, in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Strange yes, right. to or something. Um, there was another question from the uh, from the live stream uh, earlier on in the talk, which I delayed till now, uh, which is whether whether there are CSS uh, style codes known for these kind of systems. Um. Um. I think I think the answer is yes, and I think it would be uh, what are called doubled Enneon models. I think that's the closest you can get to something which would be CSS. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that, though. That's a good question. Um, oh, so uh, they come from, OK. So right, so Courtney Brell did know the answer, by the way. So um, if you look at the. <laughs> Icing model near a critical point. Um, these uh, excitations are present in blocks in some conformal field theory description. Uh, so it comes from the critical icing model, right? I did, I, I did know that at some point. Um, okay, thanks, Courtney. Uh, uh, right. So my my feeling is that the the right CSS analog codes um, would be the ones that are studied in the context of these string net models. Uh, people call these um, doubled. Uh, doubled Enneon theories. Um, I suspect that those are the CSS analogs. Can I ask what a CSS code is? Yeah, so a CSS code is just one where you have two types of stabilizers. Uh, that stabilizers where you only measure sigma, products of sigma x and stabilizers where you only measure products of sigma z. Uh, you could generalize this a bit to working with more than just qubits. Um, but uh, these are convenient because um, if I want to test for a threshold, I only need to check for a threshold with respect to um, uh, the different types of errors separately, right? Because they sort of decouple. Uh, so it's convenient. And can you reiterate how the icing model is not a CSS code? Just it's, a... um, it's non-CSS because um, the uh, gates which you can do, or the the uh, well, two reasons. I mean, we we do have a logical qubit, right? But we don't have the the stabilizers that we have aren't classifiable relative to uh, x and z for one thing. And also, the uh, logical operators, the, the operators that act on the logical space, they can do things other than just acting like x or acting like z. Um, so um, we have to treat them a little bit differently. OK, so um, uh, Daniel had a question, I think. So go ahead, Daniel. Hi, Steve. Uh, thanks very much. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, sorry, you, you mentioned towards the end that generally it's it's very hard to uh, get thresholds because you can't actually simulate the, the dynamics of, of high if dimensions. We were, if if high we were to move beyond icing anions. That's right. So, um, and you mentioned that, uh, if I understood you correctly, that, that this model is, is not universal for quantum computation unless you start using magic state distillation and, and these right. kind of tricks. So, so do I understand correctly that the threshold you compute is, is sort of in the absence of magic states, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to simulate them? And, uh, and how, would it, how would it change the pictures if you were to simulate that as well? Or what, what's the story of that? Well, uh, presumably it would become unsimulable, right? <laughs> but uh, I guess you could probably add a few magic states into the mix, uh, some bounded number or some log number, um, and you could continue to simulate that. Um, uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't thought about that question at all. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, it does. But I, I mean, the, so the the operations that you needed to oh, so you're to asking do the, the magic state distillations, I guess, still fit in the in the in the in the icing model. So you can at least um, do this part of the the threshold, I guess. Yeah, that's right. I, so I don't, if know, you, I don't know how yeah. the the total error then propagates that you introduce by becoming universal. Right. I I think. You know, if you if you're allowed to start in arbitrarily funny initial conditions, then of course you can, with just Clifford gates, you can get into very exotic states that we don't know how to simulate. Um, so as long as you put some bound on how exotic you allow your initial conditions to be, you should be able to simulate for um, a polynomial amount of time. Um, I, I think I think the correct analogy here is exactly with uh, Clifford circuits that you know you, we know how to simulate Clifford circuits with uh, a constant number of pi on eight gates thrown into the mix because we can just simulate different branches of the computation brute force right um, so uh, you could probably do something similar here in the con and and try to study uh, magic state distillation explicitly in these icing anion models. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was um, one more question from IQC, so if you want to go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually the question is similar. So uh, it's about the simulation of a general uh, anion model. Uh, since it is supposed to be hard, um, do you have an idea what would be the uh, topological feature, so a, a general uh, braiding structure would be hard to simulate. Mm -hmm. Is it clear what kind of constraint one could put on that braiding structure in order to make it uh, simple to simulate? So um, that's number of braids or things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so certainly we could simulate it for some very short amount of time uh, before it gets too entangled. Or we could try to um, simulate little uh, isolated blocks of anions um, that don't have too large of a Hilbert space. Um, we could try to use, and I know that there's some, so the next idea is ongoing work at uh, Hanover with Tobias Osborne and one of his students. Um, you can use matrix product states and ideas, and, and I think, of course, Rob Pfeiffer also um, is doing anion simulations. Uh, so you can use ideas from matrix product states and Mara and other, these tensor network onzot states to try to simulate these things. Um, uh, and then, you know, that, that can be, you, you know, you may not have uh, theoretical guarantees on the simulability, uh, but um, often those things work well in practice, even if uh, the worst case algorithm that you're, the worst case runtime of the algorithm that you're using is exponential. Um, so you can use ideas for matrix product states to study these things as well. Um, and I know of at least one success story going on uh, at Hanover, and also some of Rob's work as well. Um, so those are those are some ideas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there's uh, one more question has come from the uh, live stream. Uh, Jay Whitfield asks, um, in the plots of the results, how, how can you understand where the estimated threshold is? Um, I, I guess you <laughs> want to go to the slides for that. Yeah, uh, well, that's a really good question. Um, uh, well, because the data is not super clean, uh, which is uh, no fault of... Um, uh, Simon Burton, who uh, made, who did the numerics and made these plots, um, uh, it's you know I, I have I have confidence that uh, this is the answer. Uh, it's just not a particularly clean answer. What you're looking for is that above the threshold, the error rate should grow as a function of the system size, and below the threshold, the error rate should shrink as a function of system size. So my apologies to any colorblind viewers out there, but here we have L equals 8, L equals 16, right? This is the linear size of the lattice. So 
8 by 8 lattice, 16 by 16 lattice, etc. Then 24, 32, 48. And over here on the left hand side of this graph, the failure rate of the decoder is always decreasing. And over here on the far right hand edge of the graph, the failure rate is always increasing as I increase the number of physical qubits. So this strongly suggests that somewhere in between the two boundaries of where we've plotted, there is a threshold. Um, and then we just kind of eyeball it. Uh, there are more accurate ways to determine these thresholds. Um, like I said, this is uh, ongoing work. So we hope to get more precise values and um, more principled ways of estimating the precise crossover. Uh, but it's complicated by the fact that there are all these finite size effects. So I hope that answers your question, Jay. OK, um, so there was another question, um, I think from Noon Silk again. Um, is there um, an Anion model that is DQC1 complete? Um, so there is something related to um, not, okay, uh, not directly that I know of. However, there is a related result by uh, Stephen Jordan and Peter Shore, which showed that, um, so, so, okay, these simulations of anions are very closely related to um, estimating not polynomials, okay, so things like the Jones polynomial. Right, these are not invariants uh, that you can construct. They're topological invariants of knots. And um, you can form knots from braids by just taking a bunch of strands, braiding them, and then uh, taking the ends of the strands and then gluing them together. And depending on how you choose to glue the strands together um, actually impacts the computational complexity of computing those knot invariants. And if you, um, if you sort of cap the neighbors of the strands, that's called a plat closure of a braid to create a knot, uh, then this in general, it, then estimating the associated uh, knot polynomial uh, is in general uh, a hard problem. And it's, you know, there, you can write down BQP complete problems associated with that. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you take the strands and you glue them back on themselves like that, uh, then this is a complete problem for DQC1. Um, so this is closely related to anions, because um, like I said, there's this mapping between anion models and, these, and estimating not polynomials. But uh, it's an interesting question. I don't know that anybody's ever found an anion model which is itself complete for DQC1. Um, and perhaps partially that's because it seems to depend on this, uh, on how you choose to allow your fusion to take place. Um, so that's an interesting question. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Uh, we've been going on for a fair bit. So uh, I think we'll finish there. And thanks again very much, uh, Steve, yep. for your talk. Uh, thanks for getting up so early. And thanks to <laughs> all the people who stayed up late. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that we're going to, uh, after today, we're going to be taking a, a, a little break. And the next talk will be on the 1st of October. That'll be uh, Nicola Brunner. And uh, since we're in the summer and it's conference season. Um, <laughs> You're in the summer. Is, now is a very, well, OK, in the northern hemisphere. It's still conference season either, either way. Um, obviously, a lot of people are going to conferences and seeing a lot of talks. So now is a, would be a great time to make suggestions for future speech, speakers for Q+. Uh, I'm not doing any traveling myself, so I won't see all the great new results and, and speakers. So if you see a talk that's particularly good at one of the conferences, or have seen one, and you think it would make a good Q+, talk, then please, um, please add them to our list of suggested speakers. Uh, for those of you who are in the Hangout itself, I'm going to put the URL uh, in the chat room, but for everybody else who's on the live stream, here's a piece of paper. <laughs> I hope you'll be able to see that. That's the top uh, 
the top URL there, the suggested speakers. So that's just um, a, a Google um, spreadsheet uh, that anyone can edit. And um, you just go there and add to the new suggested speakers. It's helpful if you look down on that spreadsheet and check whether they are people that we've previously contacted first, because those are all listed there uh, to avoid multiple suggestions. But please, any time you see a good talk uh, at the conferences or during the year um, that you think um, would be good for Q+, uh, please add them to that list. OK, um, so that's it. Um, thanks, everybody, for thanks. showing up. Um, that Daniel and I will probably stick around for a minute or two, not very long, because it's getting late over here to discuss. Um, anybody who has any comment, if anybody has any comments or suggestions about how we're organizing Q+, um, then you can stick around and, and tell us about that. Um, but that's the end of the formal proceedings, and we'll see you in October. So thanks again. <laughs>